we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Shamila Ney Budel uh, with us, who is UNESCO Assistant Director General for Natural Sciences. Uh, and uh, prior to this, she served as uh, director of the Ozone Action Program at the United Nations uh, Environment Program. Uh, and um, she's been also an active researcher. She's been a director of research in the University of Paris Five, uh, and also she was nominated first class director of research at uh, INSERM. Uh, and um, she has a strong interest in managing science program. For example, she's been involved in um, uh, ethics of uh, science and technology program at UNESCO and also UN cluster for science and technology in Africa. And um, she's been coordinating the working group on uh, gender equality at UNESCO and launched the first uh, science camp for girls in South Africa. And the uh, University of Cape Town is uh, the first university for Dr. Shamila. So without very much ado, I'll hand uh, the floor to you. And um, if you have slides, uh, it's, it's a regular Zoom webinar now, so you could click screen share, or you can just talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. Gosh, uh, Irina, thank you very, very much. And thank you to all of you for giving UNESCO an opportunity and a chance uh, to join you here at the FOSS 2021 annual conference of FOSS 11. Um, I want to say at the outset, um, it, it is a pleasure for UNESCO to be invited here and to share with you how really open science can help to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, I have a presentation which I would like to share with you, and I'm going to see whether this is going to work. Let me see. You, can you see my slides now, Irina? Yes, but not in a presentation mode yet. Or, yeah, no, no, it should be fine. Can you see it now in a presentation mode? Yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. So, uh, dear participants, uh, really, thank you for inviting us. And uh, I'm just going to run you through some of the activities in UNESCO promoting open science and, um, and promoting knowledge sharing between nations and people. You're probably all aware that UNESCO was created um, and established, get this camera properly. Uh, UNESCO was created um, after the Second World War to promote peace in the minds of men and women through education, science, culture, and communication. And I'm going to give you an overview of how science can contribute to peace building between nations. Now, um, on this slide, you will see um, just an overview of UNESCO Science for Peace and Sustainable Development and Science to the Service of Humanity. And I'd like to run you through some of the initiatives at UNESCO and how we can promote, um, uh, let's say, progress towards the Sustainable Development Goal through access, through scientific, technological um, and information and innovation. Now, on this slide, you will see this is a vision of UNESCO, that the vision of a world at peace could not be a world without science. And we all know that the Sustainable Development Goals are actually built on three interlinkages, which is, um, let's say, people, planet, and prosperity. So our role here at UNESCO is to try and link all these together for a very peaceful world. And, and we want to be able to contribute to science for a peaceful world. Now, on this particular slide, I'm going to run you through some of the science related challenges of our time today. And uh, you're all very familiar with this, the failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, the extreme weather events, natural disasters, man-made environmental disasters, the biodiversity loss that we're all seeing, the ecosystem collapse and the water crisis. I'm sure all of you would have read the IPCC report, which came out in August this year, um, uh, indicating that uh, really we are, we are at the cusp of uh, a very important crossroads for humanity, and that is the climate change crisis and code red for humanity. 
So all of these global risks that I've indicated here on the left side, I also indicated in the Global Risk Report 2021, the World Economic Forum highlighted that the COP26, the IPCC, which is based on the physical sciences, and of course the IBES, uh, which brings us the latest information on biodiversity and climate change. So among UNESCO's priorities are women and Africa, the global priorities, but we also have other priority groups such as the small island developing states and um, youth, and they will bear the heaviest burden of all of these global risks. And this has put pressure on natural resources, resulting in migrations between nations, between people, uh, many conflicts because of uneven distribution of natural resources, and people being displaced for lack of water, food, and consequently job opportunities. On the next slide, you will see that science is at the core of all of the sustainable development goals. How can one achieve good health and well being without access to the latest scientific technological developments in health? We see today the role of science, technology, innovation, and engineering at the heart of combating the pandemic, whether it is a tracking system um, or respirators being developed, but also development of a vaccine has come out because of the latest advances in science and technology. So we also see uh, the role of science across all of the SDGs, whether it is improving water security or inclusive systems uh, for, for sustainable development, uh, harnessing the science, technology and innovation for poverty eradication, for food systems, but also uh, for clean energy, um, health services, and in addition to address and, and, and narrow the gap between nations. So we believe that science can really promote the uh, climate resilient communities we want for the future and that we that education for sustainable development can be part of the quality education, but we need science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to be part of those solutions to build the climate resilient communities for the future. Now this year, UNESCO also launched what is called the UNESCO Science Report. And this report is produced um, every four to five years as a, a monitoring the trends in science uh, policies, uh, scientific advances across countries and across regions. And the title of this year's report is very critical to our current time. And that is, we are in a race against time for smarter development. So are we using science to build the future we want? And the outcomes of this report have demonstrated that countries of all income levels are in a dual transition towards greener societies, building climate resilience and the green economy, but also towards digital societies. And the digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution is really at the heart of countries' investments in science, technology, and innovation. So the development priorities over the last five years have really been aligned and science, technology and innovation at the heart of this agenda in the race against time for smarter development across the regions of the world. And I want to just show you, uh, coming out of this UNESCO science report, there's been a growing, uh, let's say, a growing movement for open access to publications, sharing of scientific information and knowledge. And in 2020, about 50% of the publications in some formulation or the other were in open access. For COVID-related publications, almost 70% of the publications are in the open access arena. But still, 60% of scientific articles published in the last decade are behind some sort of paywall. And how can we then ensure that this information is accessible to all nations across the world, to scientists, so that we can really meet the development challenges through open access, open information, data sharing, and reduce the knowledge gap between nations. Now, another lesson, but one lesson learned from the COVID is that, and a silver lining coming out of the COVID, is that scientists across the world have come together in a unique demonstration of international scientific solidarity bringing together nations across the world to discuss, to share information in real time so that we could combat this disease. And this is really a true demonstration 
of open science, but it's also a true demonstration of scientific diplomacy where science can bring nations together. So this is the lessons learned from the COVID. There is an importance of sharing of timely and free access to scientific data and publications information, the importance of scientific collaborations at all level to combat this pandemic, and the importance of the science policy society uh, policy society dialogue, because nations were taking decisions based on scientific information. But that means that the scientific information has to be open, equally shared through everyone be, uh, beyond the borders and the paywalls. So this is really the importance of open science. Now, UNESCO is in the vanguard of promoting science for peace and uh, developing international standard setting instruments for scientific collaboration. And there has been a need for common definition of open science, shared set of values and principles. And therefore, in 2019, at the 40th General Assembly of UNESCO, known as the General Conference, the 193 member states mandated UNESCO with the, um, with the decision enabling UNESCO to charter the way forward and a roadmap for an international standard setting instrument on open science in the form of a UNESCO recommendation. Now, these are legal instruments in which um, the general conference would adopt and uh, legal instruments actually formulate principles and norms for the international regulation of any particular question that member states may find important and necessary to develop at a, at a global level. And of course, leaving this to the common but differentiated responsibilities of member states to implement uh, at national level. And that is really the spirit of the development of this UNESCO recommendation on open science. And almost two year process later, the text of this recommendation was developed through a broad consultative process, inclusive, transparent, multi-stakeholders across the world uh, through different stakeholder processes, bringing together uh, scientists, policymakers, publishing houses, youth, but also local indigenous knowledge populations and world intellectual property organization also contributed to, to part of the text. And this text was finally adopted by the 193 member states in UNESCO recently on the 23rd of November, 2021. So this is a ben, brand new recommendation on open science and it is really um, a very uh, uh, ambitious recommendation that is necessary today as we see science is really cross-cutting across all of the SDGs, but access to that scientific information is possible only through open science. So I just wanna run you through what are the highlights of this recommendation. First of all, it is the first international normative instrument on open science. It contains the first internationally agreed definition of open science. It spells out the consensus core values and the guiding principles, but also it addresses multiple actors and stakeholders, opinions and ideas and thoughts on open science. It recommends actions at different levels to operationalize the principles of the open science, and it promotes in proposes innovative approaches for open science at different stages of the scientific cycle. But it also calls for development of a comprehensive open science monitoring framework, and we're going to look forward to working with all of you that we, so that we could implement the open science recommendation. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to run you through just some of the key opportunities that it presents. Well, it will increase access to scientific knowledge and information. It will improve the efficiency and the quality of the scientific process. It has the quality, of course, it has the potential of making the scientific process more inclusive, more transparent, more democratic, more open. And as I said earlier on, it can be a true game, game changer in bridging the science, technology, and innovation gaps between countries to fulfill the basic human right to access to advances in scientific information. You're all aware that Article 27 on the Declaration of Human Rights calls for uh, uh, the actual access to the advances of uh, scientific uh, knowledge as uh, a human right. 
So open science is increasingly also recognized as a critical SDGs accelerator. So not only it's an SDGs accelerator, but science is an advances to scientific knowledge is really a basic human right. And that was really the principle in the development of this open science recommendation. So what will be then the role for UNESCO? So before I come to that, let me just go to a few challenges now in uh, open science for the SDGs and the implementation. And I think it's very important to understand these challenges. Uh, first of all, there has to be a change, a fundamental change in the conventional, traditional way of which we have looked at the scientific culture previously. We need to build capacity on the understanding and the principles of open science. We need to invest in adequate infrastructures. Um, many parts of the world still do not have reliable internet connectivity. We need to align the incentives and the revision criteria for evaluation of scientific excellence, scientific careers. We need to address the unintended negative consequences of open science practices, such as high article processing charges, predatory behaviors, migration, exploitation, privatization of research, data, etc. So the, these are some of the challenges that we will all face, but we can work together to ensure that the uh, advances of scientific technological uh, developments are really accessible to one and every one of us here today. So I'm looking at these slides. Yes, so now we come to the next slide, which is the role for UNESCO. And we believe that UNESCO with the S in it, S for sciences, will really be able to promote the exchange and access to information through the UNESCO Open Science, Open Science Solution programs, and the open science platforms which already exist in different parts of the world. And I'm thinking of the um, Africa Open Science Platform for the African continent. We have the Asia Open Science Platform. We have different platforms in different parts of the world. We would use these platforms as forums of exchange of ideas of good practices, lessons learned on the implementation of open science practices. And we are looking for support from all of you so that we could look towards open science policy developments and orientations and build capacity for the different actors, but also to monitor open science status, trends and the impacts. We also look forward to working with you on the mobilization of the global open science partnerships so that we can support the implementation uh, on an individual, institutional, regional, national levels. And of course, we have to build the coalitions and the consortia for the advancement of open science. Now, one of the titles I was asked to, to present here today and, and, uh, and sharing with you was firstly the open science movement of UNESCO, the open science recommendation, which was just adopted, but also how can we see it now in real practical terms? Can open science really help to achieve the sustainable development goals? And what is UNESCO doing to promote that? So we have two different programs, and I just want to give you a brief overview of them. The first program is on the monitoring of biodiversity loss and building capacities at national level for climate change adaptation strategies. And for that, we have what is called the Man and the Biosphere Program, and we will celebrate 50 years of its existence this year. It's a program which is very unique, where UNESCO designates sites, where people live in these sites, and they monitor the scientific monitoring of the biodiversity decline, biodiversity loss, and they restore the harmony of the ecosystems. I think this is a very important program for the world today as we are faced with ecosystem collapse due to climate change, uh, impact of climate change, but also uh, due to the direct drivers of human activities. So this program, which comprises 727 biosphere reserves in 131 countries, co cover almost 8 million square kilometers across the world and 270 million people call biosphere reserves their home. So they're able to undertake scientific monitoring of the biodiversity loss. They have developed tools, methodologies, um, and they call the biosphere reserves their home. And this is an important program to share information and knowledge on the si environmental sciences, biogeological, 
and the ecological sciences so that we can valorize mother nature. Another important program I want to share with you is UNESCO's program, uh, which is called the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program. Now, earlier on in, during the establishment of UNESCO in 1946, when the S was put in the middle of UNECO and the S came in the middle, UNESCO started funding programs across the world on, on water management. And we see today that water connects and is at the center of all the SDGs and the related agendas. You look at all the SDGs, whether it's a par and you look at the Paris Agreement, you look at water related disasters, urban agenda, and you look at the UN Convention on Desertification, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. You look at all of these conventions, link water and link the SDGs. And every indicator that measures um, an, uh, a particular SDG has a link to water. And water is really at the center of the SDGs. So how can open science contribute to this SDG, which is called SDG 6, which is actually promoting clean water and sanitation for the poor populations across the world? Now, of course, the solutions to water-related problems are not just technical, engineering, or natural sciences, but you, it needs a strong uh, what we call the human and social cultural dimensions. And there's an ever increasing pace of the impact of climate change on the hydrological systems and water. And how can open science then promote access to safe water across the world? And I'm gonna run you through the story of UNESCO from 1946 to today. It's International Intergovernmental Hydrological Program promoting open science solutions for water management and a water secure and a water safe world. So here I will run you through just a very quick slide, which is showing an, uh, uh, what is called the SDG 6 uh, Global Accelerator Framework, which was launched last year by the United Nations on 9th of July, 2020, saying that progress on the SDG 6 is alarmingly off track. And it calls upon all the UN system to better coordinate and to target the use of water resources sustainably. Now, what, what we've learned is that 2.2 billion people around the world still lack safely managed drinking water. This includes 785 million without basic drinking water. And the population that is using safely managed uh, uh, sanitation services has increased, but 4.2 billion people worldwide still lack safely managed sanitation and 2 billion without basic sanitation. Why? What is it that we have done that is so wrong and that we've not met the needs through access to science, technology, and innovation? We have seen that water is the connector. Every drop counts. It links all the SDGs. But the SDG 6 on access to water and sanitation is so largely off track. So what can we do in terms of open science and what can UNESCO offer? So I would like to take you through the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program of UNESCO, which is based on three pillars. Firstly, mobilizing international scientific cooperation to improve the knowledge and innovation to address water security challenges. And we work through numerous networks across the world. Then we need to strengthen the science policy interface so that we can reach water security at global, regional, national levels. And we must facilitate water education and water capacity building to enhance water resources management. And here, I would like to take you through the evolution of this program. And I've not put the from 1945 to now, but let's start from the international hydrological decade uh, in understanding large floods, the world water balance, taking us through international cooperation in hydrological sciences, all the way through to we've just come out of the IHP 8 program, which was looking at water security and responses to global regional challenges. And we are going now to the IHP 9, which will be launched next year. 
And this IHP9 program is a very important program because it builds on all these decades of building capacities for water secure world. We're moving from hydrological sciences to integrated science policy and society in the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program 9, which is, will be launched and starts next year. Oops, sorry. So I think, let's see what's happened. Right. So this program, IHP 9, 2022-2029, is promoting science for water secure world in a changing environment. There are five priority areas, scientific research and innovation, water education in the fourth industrial revolution, bridging the data gap, and integrating water resource management under the conditions of global change, like climate change, and water governance based on science mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. So the aim of this IHP-9 is really science for water secure world in a changing environment. And the reason I want to take you through this, I want to show you how we all can contribute to the goal six, to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And it will contribute to all the other SDGs through open science. So how can UNESCO contribute through open science for water secure world? UNESCO is functioning under the auspices of the UN water family. We have 36 uh, very specialized centers on water. These are category one centers based on sedimentation, flow rate, uh, integrated water management. We have 169 specialist national committees in 169 countries. We have 66 university chairs, numerous initiatives worldwide. And we have the World Water Assessment Program, which produces annually the United Nations World Water Development Report. This year's report was called Valuing Water. And these reports produced every year give you the trends in water, the latest information on, on water sciences and how to build the next gam of water professionals in the true spirit of open science. Now, I want to give you just some very brief um, examples of what we are doing to promote open science in the making to build water resilient communities. Lake Chad in Central Africa is sh shared by six nations. 45 million people live along around the Lake Chad Basin. It is home to two world heritage sites, UNESCO Biosphere, the Ramsar wetlands of international importance to the world today. So this project is uh, doing a drought monitoring, water quality, restoring the degraded ecosystems and developing income generating activities like spirulina. These are these green um, algae and its production, uh, building uh, uh, community resilience, income generating for women to reduce poverty. And we're using the latest scientific technological information to restore degraded ecosystems, bringing together scientists from across the world to share the data and information. And here you see the UNESCO Water Quality Monitoring Platform, which is an open source platform available to all participants, all countries across the world. And this is an international collaboration uh, initiative, understanding the, the density of the lake, the pollution in the lake, and the proliferation, for example, of harmful algae. And this is really a true demonstration in the true spirit of open science, sharing information and data with nations and populations that really need our support. Another uh, project I would like to take you through is the water disaster uh, platform to enhance climate resilience in Africa. We are using artificial intelligence related data integration and analysis systems and targeting many different countries, Niger, Volta, um, as well as the, the Niger uh, Basin Authority, uh, West Africa, Central Africa, and we are promoting water cooperation with the latest information in trends, in, uh, in impact of climate change on water, uh, predictions, uh, satellite rainfall data, and also looking at simulated river flow and, and floods. Now, this demonstrates to you that the latest scientific knowledge and information can be made available to those water stressed communities across the world in the true spirit of sharing information and data. Another project which I wanted to share with you is the climate change impact on snow glaciers, uh, on snow glaciers and the water resources. We have seen the uh, snow glacier melting 
and the impact it has on mountainous populations um, and the importance of preserving the cryosphere. So we are promoting scientific knowledge, uh, doing modeling and observatory studies to understand the scale of the climate change on these uh, cryospheres, which is really our heritage, our uh, international heritage and human heritage. We're looking at the impact on indigenous local population, context specific, understanding the social cultural dimensions of this, but we're also looking at education and building climate literacy, environmental literacy among these populations so that they can adapt to climate change. So science for water secure world in a changing environment can be possible if we can ensure that we have open, open science, uh, open data and sharing of scientific information. And one last uh, example I wanted to share with you here is a Lake Laza. Um, it's a demo, demo site in Argentina. We have seen a number of deforestation, soil erosion, water pollution, worse temperature increases, intensive urban and road development, natural hazards, and also hydroclimatic hazards. But using scientific data and information, promoting international scientific collaboration in the true spirit of open science, we're able to develop models for this region to model the watersheds, the river in restoration, and develop policies for, these, for the regions sharing this watershed. And it's really through this uh, hydrological vulnerability maps that the, that the populations could be, begin to restore this uh, eco-hydrology demonstration site and make sure that the water quality is improved, mitigation of hazards, and provide economic benefits to societies. So this is really the true spirit of open science. And another program that we have, you may be aware that UNESCO is also home to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic uh, Commission. It's the only Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission that monitors the oceans. And with this program and Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, we are assisting countries to combat the uh, impacts of climate change through early warning systems, the latest science and technology, and to address the climate vulnerability and water resilience, especially in the small island developing states. So an assessment is undertaken with the latest scientific knowledge and data through with different partners and partnerships within the UN and outside of the UN to share the information, identify the vulnerability, and then to develop policy and address the gaps that we see in the policy to, to, to build resilient communities. Uh, we're also looking at water resilience due to floods uh, and also um, climate change um, adaptation strategies in different parts of the world, not only in the islands, but also coastal zones and other countries affected. We have seen a number of floods, for example, in Africa, and we've developed a number of case studies. And we provide these, uh, this information to countries to enhance the preparedness to respond to the climate vulnerability and build water resilience in different communities. And just the last slide that we wanted to share with you is this slide on UNESCO's open access water information network systems, which groups 193 member states across the world, sharing information on water resources across the world, whether it's environmental water stress, transboundary uh, uh, water sharing, whether it's across heritage sites, world heritage sites, UNESCO's biosphere reserves, or even wastewater coverage in mega cities. We have a large program on urban water management. And this open access demonstrates that it is possible to share information in the true spirit of open science. So I hope this gives you an overview of how we can promote scientific technological cooperation and uh, cooperation in uh, research to share information and data in the true spirit of open science. <coughs> Excuse me. So I invite you all to become a champion of open science and join the movement. You can download our, our website and please join us and let's promote the spirit of open science. And I've given you an example of how access uh, to open science can really build a water secure world. Thank you very much, Irina. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Shamila, for sharing this stories of change. And thanks a lot for your leadership uh, on um, UNESCO recommendation on open science. Uh, it's really exciting moment. And we have some questions and let me read them um, to you. So some of them are from Joe Haveman and I'll start with them. How does UNESCO include uh, social science and humanities uh, in the recommendation? Because uh, uh, UNESCO website hosts open science section on their natural sciences category. And if you could please comment on that. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so when we talk about the S in UNESCO, it is the natural sciences and the social sciences. And we work very closely with them. Uh, we have initiated now different collaborations, uh, for example, in Africa, on looking at the STI ecosystem and how the social sciences can be taken on board, especially when countries design STI policies. How do they monitor the impact of the policies? How do they take into account the impact of technologies on societies, technologies, especially also on women and uh, different populations? Uh, we have a strong collaboration with the social sciences, and I believe that in the open science arena, there is more scope for collaboration, because if you want to look at the human rights access to advances in scientific information, we need to measure the impact on societies. How are societies accessing that information and how it can be used to benefit the societies measuring social impacts? You may be aware that the UNESCO General Conference has also adopted the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And this is managed by the social sciences sector. And we work very closely with them. It will, we will work also with them in that particular recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And we believe that these two recommendations are really critical and key for the fourth industrial revolution measuring the impacts on societies and especially on women. And there we definitely will work very closely with the social sciences. I am sure my other colleagues are also online with us. Maybe Anna Pesic, uh, who has been working very closely on the open science recommendation with Peggy Oti Boateng, Ezra Clark. I'm not sure if they are online, perhaps they are. And they may wish to take the floor as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question. Uh, how do you foresee indigenous knowledge complement scholarly knowledge systems in the near future and move it forward towards achieving uh, sustainable development goals? Well, I think the indigenous knowledge is critical for achieving the sustainable development goals for a number of reasons. First of all, the um, the role of indigenous knowledge populations is uh, very important in bringing on board another knowledge stream. And we need to bridge the gap between the natural sciences and the different knowledge streams, such as the social sciences, as well as local indigenous knowledge systems. They are critical to bringing a holistic perspective on the challenges that societies face today. It is not possible to exclude them from this dialogue. They have important insights into our understanding of living in harmony with nature, monitoring the biodiversity and adapting to climate change, but also uh, in, in our basic well-being. So they are critical to promoting understanding the relationships between cultures, how we interact with one another, how cultures embrace technologies, how cultures pass on our, uh, uh, let's say, our core values to our children and to different generations. And we need all of this together to be able to address the challenges of the 21st century. So yes, they are critical and important to developing, uh, to in delivering on the sustainable development goals. Now, indigenous knowledge uh, peoples were also invited to join us on this uh, in, the, in the platform on open science. And I see my colleague who is here with us, uh, uh, Hindu, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if she's with us on board, but she's uh, the special envoy for indigenous knowledge populations and uh, leading also the dialogue of making sure that they are integrated into all of our programs. 
The program I showed you on Lake Chad would not have been possible without the inputs of the local indigenous knowledge um, and the people who live around the lake because they have the best knowledge of how to live sustainably and in harmony with nature and restoring the harmony of ecosystems. And their, uh, um, I would say, contributions to the restoration of the Lake Chad in promoting the dialogue between the cultures in sustainably using Lake Chad and putting in place sustainable fishing models was critical to reducing conflict, but sustainably using the natural resource of Lake Chad. So this is a very good example of indigenous knowledge contributing to sustainable development goals of 45 million people and promoting peace between nations. Thank you so much, Sharon. And then a complicated question, and I'll read it to you. Uh, open access is important for knowledge dissemination. However, most for profit publishers uh, publishing open access journals uh, increased article processing charges. Therefore, researchers from institutions that can't afford them will not publish their findings. It will create another inequality before many researchers couldn't access. Now they, their research will not be visible. I see it as a big challenge. Is there a way UNESCO can play a role in helping to change, regulate the cost of knowledge access and dissemination? Thank you for this difficult question, Irina. Uh, puts us rather on the spot, but I'm going to speak uh, to the heart of these open access journals who have increased the charges. If there's a silver lining in the COVID pandemic, it was the international solidarity shown by scientists. Problems and emerging global problems today are global in nature. And no single unit or research group can address the global challenges on their own. So we need to team up together and to continue to build this international solidarity so we can address global challenges. And we at UNESCO will continue to promote this international scientific solidarity among scientists. And I would therefore call upon the publishers and our international scientific journals to join the movement. We do have a role to play in society and access to information is key if we do not want to create a new apartheid of knowledge sharing. Coming from the apartheid era of South Africa, I will appeal here to all those journals who are listening to us here today, let's not create another new apartheid era of scientific information. Let's share scientific information for the good of society. Science should be open. We, we are all scientists and we know the value of science so that we can contribute to the sustainable development goals and beyond. And to build sustainable societies, we need everyone on board. We need access to the scientific knowledge and information. So we at UNESCO will continue to plead for international global solidarity to ensure that no one is left behind. And that would be my appeal here today, that we do not create a new, a new apartheid of knowledge sharing. Thank you so much, Sharon. And um, thanks a lot for spending this hour with us. Sir, and Apologies for the difficulties you had. Uh, so, thank um, you. Thank you very much for inviting us. And all those listening to us here today, please join the movement. It is important to publish, and it's very important to share your knowledge and information. There's so many uh, research institutes across the world who would like to share your knowledge and be part of the movement. Let's ensure that we leave no one behind. It is our role in society today to promote this international solidarity and the scientific humanism is at the heart of UNESCO's work and it should be at the heart of every scientist's work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and have a Thank good you. rest of the day and um, have a good conference colleagues uh, and see you at other sessions and um, thanks a lot for spending this hour with us. Uh, Thank you, Irina. Thank you for inviting UNESCO. And uh, I do hope one day to welcome you all home to UNESCO. It's your home where we promote 
uh, peace through education, science, culture, and communication to make sure that no one is left behind. So let's share information and let's collaborate with one another and promote the international scientific solidarity. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your leadership. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks.